this cool screen and I asked everybody to take out their phones and to text in doubts or questions or things that you had, things you were unsure of about God. And uh, we got some really intense questions up there. Somebody in the older group um, said, like, I doubt that Travis will ever have thicker hair. And that was... I'm still hurt from that, but uh, but we also got some really good, legitimate questions and doubts and things from all of you, such as... Um, Does God hear me when I pray? Um, Does God really even care about me when I'm hurting? Does God really have a plan for my life? And even, uh, does God really even exist? Um, Just some real honest doubts and real honest questions that we have about God. And and so then in your small groups, if you were here last week, what you were supposed to do was to go back and just kind of make a list of your doubts. Make a list of your questions. And then if your small group leaders were good, what they were supposed to do was to answer every question you've ever had about God in that group. Who, how many people did that happen for? How many groups? 
No? Okay. All right, we're going to work on that. we got to work on that. Um, now, one thing that is true about doubt. Hello, can you hear me? Is this thing on? I feel like there's a lot of chatter in the room this evening. Focus. Focus. Here we go. One thing that's true about doubt is everybody has it. There's not a single person in the world that doesn't have doubt. And I don't know about you, but I don't always handle my doubt in the healthiest way. Um, Here's an example. Um, Sometimes when we experience doubt, we're really tempted to give up. Now, for sports fans, I am a big Cubs fan. Chicago Cubs. Yeah. Yeah! Yes! The last time the Cubs won the World Series was 103 years ago. And so... I have started to become really, really tempted to doubt the Cubs. And so, in that doubt, don't don't even talk about the Pirates. In that doubt, sometimes I'm tempted to give up on the Cubs and to find another team to cheer for. Um, And so, you know, sometimes I just think I need to completely give up and go a different direction and do something else. And when it comes to our doubts about God, like how do we take the doubts that we have and the questions that we have, and, and how do we also have faith at the same time? I think that's a really hard question that we've got to figure out how to deal with. Um, what are we supposed to do when the doubts creep in? You know, what about when we doubt when God hears us? Uh, what about uh, when we doubt God is there? What about when the temptations that we're facing seem to be stronger than ever? What do we do in those situations? Like, what do we do when a doubt is too big? Do we do what I'm tempted to do with the Cubs when our doubts get too big about God? Do we just give up on God? Or is there another alternative for us? And, um, and when it comes to the Bible, if the Bible is a, is a collection of books that's all about faith, how can I pick that up and read it when it feels like my life is all about doubt? It's so hard to do. But what I want us to do tonight is look at a specific, uh, a specific passage of Scripture, which we'll get to in a minute, but... Um, What I love about the Bible, it's easy to look at the Bible and think, you know what, the Bible is all about perfect people who have it all together, and uh, it's a perfect faith story, and and if I look at it, I'll just be intimidated. But what I love about the Bible is that if you read it, you'll find that it is a story, story after story, of real people who had real lives. They faced real situations. They had real emotions. They had real faith and really big faith. But a lot of times they also had really, really, really big doubts about God and about life and just in general. And so surprisingly, we can look at the Bible and learn a lot about what it means to have faith, but also to have doubt. And so we're going to look at Psalm 13 tonight. Uh, Psalm 13 was written by a guy named David. Now, David was one of the most central figures in the Old Testament. He was like the, the most prominent king that Israel ever had uh, in the Old Testament. Um, But he was also a normal guy. David made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of dumb things. But he was also, uh, it also said in in Samuel that David was a man after God's own heart. So David is another guy. He was like lifted up for his faith. Um, But I want us to read Psalm 13 together. This was written by David. And let's just check this out. David says, How long will you forget me, Lord? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I be left to my own wits, agony filling my heart? Daily? How long will my enemy keep defeating me? Look at me. Answer me, Lord my God. Restore sight to my eyes. Otherwise, I'll sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I won. My foes will rejoice over my downfall. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. Yes, I will sing to the Lord because He has been good to me. David does three things here that I think those of us who have doubts but we want to have faith can do. The first thing, uh, the first thing is this. He simply lets God have it. He just lets God have it. He says, he's basically saying in the first two verses, God, where the heck are you? What's the deal? What's going on? Have you completely forgotten about me? And I think sometimes a lot of us feel like that. Like, God, where are you? Um, However, I think most of us, a lot of times we're afraid to say things like that because uh, we think it's not okay for us to have doubt. We think God can't handle our doubt. 
Uh, we think if we say that kind of thing to God, God will be offended. But that's not what David's doing here. David knows he has doubts and he's honest about them and he just lets God have it. And so for us, I think if we're really trying to, to wrestle with this stuff, when we have doubts, I think it's perfectly fine for every single one of us to do the same thing that David did here. Uh, sometimes that might mean you can just you can write out your doubts. You can just write them out to God like you're writing God a, a letter or something. Sometimes you might pray about it. Sometimes you might even want to just yell. Just yell to God your doubts. And I've, I've done that before. It actually feels pretty good to do. Um, but that's what David does in this scenario. The second thing that David does, um, he asks God to do something different. David says, I'm, I'm doubting you. It feels like you've forgotten me in the first two verses. And then verses 3 and 4, David says, look at me. Answer me. Things are not going the way I want them to go. Please do something different. And I think we can do the same thing. When we have doubts, we can say to God, God, this is not how I want it to be. Please do something different. And then the third thing that David does, he remembers the good things from the past. Um, He says here in uh, verses 5 and 6, But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because He has been good to me. He remembers something good that's happened in the past. Now last week, Kristen sang a song. It's one of my favorite hymns. It's called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's got this real weird verse in it, though, uh, where, where it says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Yeah, it just sounds goofy. Who knows what that is? Who's ever heard of that before? Or you've, you've seen those words and you've been like, I'm not going to sing that because I don't know what that means. Yeah, here I raise my Ebenezer. It comes actually from uh, 1 Samuel 7, 12, which I've got up here on the screen, I think. It says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshunah. These are two places. He named it Ebenezer, explaining the Lord helped us to this very... It's like his pet rock. That's what I think. <laughs> he sets up a stone and he names it. It's so sweet. He teaches it tricks. No. Um, it says he named it Ebenezer, explaining the Lord helped us to this very point. So what an Ebenezer is, is it's, a, it's like a monument. It's sort of an altar that helps you remember something awesome that God has done in the past. And so sometimes when we're in the middle of doubt and we have questions about God, we can look back and think back to some really good things that God has done in the past. We've got a couple people, Taylor and Miss Carol, are going to come and they're going to talk for just a second about a couple things that have meant a lot to them. Maybe like their Ebenezer or an Ebenezer that they've had from their past. And they're both going to come up. Taylor's going to go first. Never mind. Okay, well, hi, guys. My name's Taylor. Um, I'm a junior at Ravenwood. And um, basically, we're all talking about doubt. And it's not something I like to admit that I have, but I know that we all do. But um, one of the things that I never really considered a doubt, I just neglected to think about, um, Sometimes, often, when things are going wrong or when I'm stressed or when I'm scared, when I'm hurting, I doubt that um, God has a plan for my life and that God is going to use my obstacles to help me, like, grow closer to Him and just, like, be, like, His servant. Like, when bad things happen, I don't think, oh, God's here. Like, that's awesome. That's just not what I think about. And um, I know we all go through so many trials in our lives, but one of the more recent ones, kind of a lighter one. This summer, I wanted to go to Camp Barnabas. I know a lot of you are familiar with that. But um, my family vacation, like we scheduled, was during the week our church was going. And I was so upset that I couldn't go. And I was like, really? We're just, I'm not going to get to go to Camp Barnabas. I'm really upset. And I was kind of being really negative about it. And then one of my friends was like, oh, it's okay. You can come to camp with me. And so we decided for a different week, we were going to go together. And then I procrastinated. And um, by the time I applied, they were full. And again, I was just so upset. And I was like, really? All I'm trying to do is go serve God. And God's not helping me out, like, at all. He's just being like, nope, can't go. So then, um, eventually, my mom was like, no, I know you really want to do this. We're going to get you there. And Camp Barnabas um, was going national this summer. And they had a camp in Memphis. And so the very end of the summer, I went to to Camp Barnabas in Memphis. But it was really different because 
I was completely alone. I knew nobody going, and I was absolutely terrified about that. Because for those of you who have heard about Camp Barnabas or have ever been, it's one of those places that you have to have like spiritual, just like support. You have to have like your friends there, your family, somebody to care for you and carry you through that week. It is so hard and draining. And so I was just terrified that I wouldn't be able to do it. And then I, um, I got there and I was like, this is nothing like the Camp Barnabas in Missouri. The campsite was different. I was so just like out of my element. And I was like, well, this is just going to be the most awful week of my life. And I was kind of already at a low place in my faith during the summer, just recurring events that were just really bringing me down. So I got there, and I just wasn't with God at all. I was just trying to go it on my own and do things my way. That was obviously getting me nowhere. And about halfway through the week, I was just exhausted. I hadn't talked to God at all. I was just miserable, and I was really hurting, and just I didn't understand why. I was in this beautiful place, and I was, like, the one who was suffering so badly. And, um, oh, another thing. I was the only, there were two people in the entire camp who got two campers instead of one. So I had like double the stress and I was just like about to break down. And um, anyway, about halfway through the week, um, one of my campers just got insanely upset and she was just sobbing on her bed and I couldn't do anything to console her. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I've ruined this girl's life. I don't know what's going on. No one can help me because we can't like help her right now. And so, um, Eventually, I just like, I was like, I need to be with her right now. And so I went over to her, and I just started like rubbing her back. And then like, she just like all of a sudden got up and just laid in my lap. And I was just holding this um, camper, and she's sobbing uncontrollably. And I was just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, I was not planning on doing this at all. But then I was just like, I need to pray for her. Just let her know that she's loved. And while I'm like freaking out in my head that I've got some woman sobbing all over me and these words just start coming out of me that weren't mine and I was like just reminding her of how much she was loved and how important she was and so like while I was telling her that it reminded me that as well and that was just really cool and then like in that moment I realized that was God's purpose for me he knew that I wasn't going to be able to go to Camp Barnabas with church and he knew that I was going to procrastinate and miss the deadline for the second Camp Barnabas term but he knew I was going to be in Memphis with her so that I could tell her how much God loves her. And it was just in that moment that I realized, like, everything that I go through, no matter how much I hate it, no matter how much I want to just ignore the pain or whatever's going on, God is going to use that, and he already knows the wonderful benefits from it. And so I know we all go through so many trials just in our day-to-day lives. I have a couple of verses I want to share with you. The first one comes from 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. It says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is temporary, for what is seen is temporary, but for what is unseen is eternal. And that just kind of like, this is a verse I learned at Barnabas actually. And it's just like one of those like, duh, like why am I stressing out about all these things? things that are hurting me here when I've got someone who's looking out for me through everything I do. And then the second one is 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And that one says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's just like such an awesome reminder of how God's going to use everything that we go through, no matter what we're thinking at the time, but it's really going to bring us closer to him. My last one is just like my favorite verse that I thought you guys could all appreciate, because I know you guys have things going on, is Joshua 1.9, and it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And so I guess like my hope for you all is that no matter what you go through, you know that someone's looking out for you, and it's going to use everything you go through to bring you closer to Him. Thanks, Gary. Kayla, that was awesome. Hey, guys, I'm Miss Carol. Wow, it's bright up here. Hello. Oh, I need my shades. Um, 
Okay, well, I was asked to bring an item, kind of like you guys were, to just, to kind of, I guess, to show how I was um, touched by God. And when I went through confirmation, when I was probably younger than you guys were, my parents had been missionaries in East Africa, and I lived there with them. And when I came home and went through confirmation in the United States, my parents had brought something back with us to give to me during confirmation. And I had, just like you guys, gone through all of the training that you do and, and you know, a lot of the soul searching that you do. It's just, you know, my, I was raised a Christian and now it's my turn to really commit, you know, that I really believe in God. And um, I remember going through that and just, oh, being so touched by all that you know, soul searching. And um, when I went through and I really committed and I really accepted Christ as my Lord and my Savior, my parents, and it's going to break me up a little bit, but they gave me this crucifix. And it's um, it was made in Africa. So they brought it from Africa. And um, it's right here. Hold on. It's in pieces. And for me, it depicts um, how, I'm, how I'm broken without Christ. And when I put it together... <laughs> okay, I'm whole, and um, it it lives in my home, and it lives in a very prominent place, and it has forever since I was was at home, and then I went to college, and it went with me to college, and then it's in my home today, and it re- represents for me the wholeness I have in Christ. Um, without Him, I'm completely broken, just like you guys are, because um, we're all sinners and we're all broken. We're all really nothing without Him. And um, this is my little piece of, um, uh, of an item that, that is dear to me and um, shows how I'm so very human, but with Christ, I can do so much. Um, and I'll share a Bible verse. And I'm, I'm real short. Taylor, you are awesome. Um, she sh- shared such a, a lovely story, but mine is pretty short. Um, Philippians 4.13 is one of my most favorite verses, and it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For me, it means without God, I'm nothing. But with Him, I can do absolutely anything. I can move mountains. And that's my story. Okay, Okay, I'm Erica. I go to Ravenwood. I'm a senior. Um, I was just going to, like, share share an experience. Um... A lot of you guys probably have done this, but um, on choir retreat every year. I didn't get to go this year, but um, in the past years, um, just like going on choir tour, do you know the thing like where you, um, they like blindfold you and they like take you down to the lake? Um, and that just like, like doing that, being in the moment, um, that just meant so much to me. Like that's where I felt closest to God. Um, just like being there and knowing that you don't have to say anything. Like you just listen to God. That's what like makes the biggest difference for me. And I have something from Psalm too, and it is Psalm 18, and it says, um, "The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my." De- Deliverer, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield in the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And I think it's most important to um, not talk to, like not to have someone to talk, I mean, someone to talk to, but I think just being there and like not saying anything, just being just like being blindfolded and not having to say anything and just being there with God, I feel like everyone's out there to like search for answers about doubt like they're all looking for the right answer and I believe we should stop looking for the answer and just start listening because God didn't make answers out there he didn't put answers out there for us to like look so when you're blindfolded it just kind of puts things into perspective like you don't need to go look looking for them it's all right in front of you you just need to listen to him 
and just really like pray with him and just be with him and sometimes saying nothing like helps the most um just like having someone leading you down to the lake and not having to say anything um that's when i felt closest to god so I'm Nick Contini. I'm a senior at Brown High School. Uh, I'm one of those people that, uh, you know, I'm one of those, you know, everything happens for a reason, you know. Um, but often I'll find myself, um, something bad will happen to me, and I'll be like, you know what, God, what was that for? That was a, that was a low blow. What was that for? And then, I'll, you know, I'll try, he'll try to tell me. And I won't listen. I'll just be like, no, what was that for? I'm not listening to you. You know, just kind of like when your mom takes your cell phone or something like that. Yeah, well, that doesn't happen to me, but. Um, <laughs> so, but then usually I'll stop, I'll cool down, I'll be like, okay, wait. I gotta remember all good things come from God, and only good things come from God. You know, so I'll take a breather, I'll, I'll apologize, I'll be like, God, I'm stupid. I should have I listened. And so then I remember stories like this in John 9. Um, as he went along, Jesus, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, what they're basically saying is like, dude, what did this guy do wrong? He hasn't sinned. Why is he blind? Why did God make him blind? And so... Jesus replies, Neither this man nor his parents have sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it isn't day, we must do the works of, of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can at work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud of saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sin. Okay. <laughs> So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So um, basically, you know, there's this guy, he's been blind for his whole life. And he was like, dude, what's this? I mean, I haven't done anything wrong. And then uh, it turned out to be a great thing. He got to be an example of God's power and God's grace. And so I just remember not just that story, but the bajillions of story is in this book that are exactly like that, that all things all good things come from God. So. All right, I want to pray for you guys before you go to your group. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this night. And we thank you for the fact that you are bigger than our doubts. That no matter what questions or doubts or thoughts we have, we can't scare you away. And God, that's so awesome and comforting to know that. Um, God, help us to help us to be honest. Help us to be courageous enough to turn to you with our doubts and help us to remember awesome things that have happened in our own lives or to see things that have happened in the world or in other people's lives that remind us of you and that remind us that you are always there. I thank you for Taylor and for Carol and for their willingness to share their stories. And God, I pray for everybody in this room that as they go to their group tonight, it'll be an awesome time. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.